Okay, as we begin our discussions of resistivity, um, it's, it's worth taking a minute just to kind of compare and contrast resistivity with terrain conductivity. In the resistivity approach, you'll notice something a little bit different over here. We're interested in current flow within the subsurface. And you can see in order to, to do this, to make these kinds of measurements with the resistivity method, we have to punch electrodes into the ground. And then we have to hook them up to a battery in order to get uh, kind of upset the balance of things. And there, there are several issues associated with this kind of uh, uh, procedure. One is that you do have to get the current in the ground, and in a place like this, where it's very dry, you might be scratching your head and saying, well, what kind of, um, how, how much electric current am I actually getting down into the uh, deeper formations? <clears throat> it's very dry, it's going to have a high resistivity and so on. So, um, so this, this uh, method differs significantly from the terrain conductivity approach because in terrain conductivity we were inducing uh, current flow. We didn't have to have some sort of uh, mechanical uh, means for actually getting electromagnetic fields into the subsurface. So that's a, a, a significant, uh, significant difference there. And the basic setup we have a, um, um, a sloppy looking diagram here, a little bit lazy. Uh, but you can see that we have a battery. And we've got positive and negative electrodes. Uh, current is generally considered to be the direction of flow of the positively charged particles. And we know that in most circuits, electrons are going this way. Current's going that way. But the idea is that we have some something going on in the subsurface that we're interested in finding out more about. You know, where it is, how deep it is, how extensive it is, how extensive vertically and laterally it is. So we're injecting current. We expect to see some perturbation at this point that we might not see over at this point. So again, we have a battery, a computer, we have electrodes, we have electrodes that are um, stuck in the ground. Uh, we're measuring potential differences between these electrodes. This is uh, a modern day uh, resistivity meter and actually there are newer models of uh, the uh, AGI Sting, uh, Sting Swift um, uh, resistivity meter. So we can actually, instead of just having four electrodes, uh, you know, two potential electrodes, a source and a sink electrode, uh, we can have um, 30, 40, 60 electrodes stuck in the ground all at once, and we can measure potential differences between more or less all possible combinations. So, so it, it's a nice uh, system, and uh, once you get it set up and ready to go, you can uh, uh, push the button, it'll do its work, and then you get uh, a nice plot at the end of the, uh, end of the session. So in this case, uh, again, we're, we're, we're not trying to measure the electric force, the electric field intensity, uh, the charge of an unknown object. We're, we're out there. We're, we're, we're dealing with ionized solutions, most likely, in subsurface, uh, subsurface intervals. And we're just trying to upset the balance. We're trying to create current flow. Uh, we want to determine the resistivities of various layers by looking at how uh, potential differences vary um, from point to point uh, along the surface. So, so again, here's a, here's a layout. We have the uh, resistivity meter, the control box, uh, computer uh, set up here. We have the electrodes going down the hill. This is in a coal mine refuse area, so we can see a uh, settling pond. Uh, very acidic water, uh, problems in, in the Appalachian area and probably others as well. But we're looking at how resistivity varies in this mine spoil region. And here we have a comparison of the results. This is a um, uh, <clears throat> 2D map view 
of this area. We were just looking at a line going down over the hill towards that uh, settling pond. This is terrain conductivity. We have higher conductivity in this area. And then down below here we have resistivity. Now the resistivity, this is actually a hill, so we're kind of going downhill. Uh, but you can see that the resistivity is low in this area. So remember how to convert resistivity to conductivity. We take the reciprocal, let's say the reciprocal of 10 is 0.01. We multiply it by uh, 1,000. So this is a resistivity of about a 100 ohm meters here. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, or a, a conductivity of about 100 ohm meters. So higher than, uh, uh, excuse me, 100 millimoles per meter. So this low resistivity region corresponds with the high conductivity region that we see here. And in the subsurface, it's uh, much higher in places than it appears on average. Uh, this was data collected using the EM31. So it's kind of a comparison. We see high conductivity, low resistivity. Uh, what else can you do with it? Well, and what factors uh, affect resistivity? Here's um, uh, not too much of a mystery that we should be able to see this cave. This is a tunnel entrance to a facility that was used to uh, produce the V-1 rockets during World War II. I think I've seen something on TV about this, seen the insides of this area. Kind of very, very fascinating. But yes, we could find it with a resistivity survey. Uh, it has all the things that we need in order to produce a nice conductive or resistivity contrast. Uh, it's, uh, it's a tunnel. It's got high porosity, obviously. Very good permeability. We can walk through the place. And, well, the, you know, the idea wasn't to fill it with water. That would kind of ruin the but in our case, in geological examples, we're, you know, we want to see water. Uh, and we're usually looking at, okay, is it contaminated water uh, or is it fresh water? If it's fresh water, then it's going to have low resistivity, or excuse me, high resistivity and, and low conductivity. And if it has a lot of dissolved elect electrolytes, in other words, if it's contaminated, then it's going to have very high conductivity and low resistivity. So these are the, this is kind of the duality between uh, resistivity and uh, uh, conductivity methods. Here we're looking for a freshwater bearing um, aquifer and uh, the, the fresh, freshwater interval is showing up here along a, what is interpreted to be a fracture zone within the, uh, in the bedrock in this area. <clears throat> and again, you can see it has the lowest resistivity, you say, well, that's not good. That means high conductivity, but do the conversion. Remember how to do the conversions. 100 ohm meters. Well, this is ohm feet, but let's let's just use the ohm meter uh, idea. We could do this for feet, uh, but uh, since we've talked about how to do this for meters, this would be 1 over 100. It would be 0.01 times 1,000. That would give us 10 uh, 10 millimoles per meter. So, so this is probably fresh water. It's still low conductivity. The rocks have very high resistivity. And that, that makes sense too because their porosity obviously is a lot less than you would find in a, a fracture zone. Their, their permeability is, is, is much, much less as well. And, um, you know, whatever water is in there, whether it's fresh or not, I think the main factors controlling the resistivity of the surrounding bedrock, of course, is going to be the, um, uh, just the reduced porosity and permeability. So, um, <clears throat> if we take a look at, if we kind of do a comparison, can we repeat, do a repeat, repeatability test? Uh, this is an example that shows that when we do the same thing, when we do the run the same survey twice in the same area, we get very similar results. I mean, you can see some necking here in these contours, uh, but we can see this uh, granite boulder uh, very well. It shows up very nicely in these two data sets, and the, and the contours are remarkably uh, similar.
So, so it's it's a fairly repeatable uh, process. Got a granite boulder in there. No problem seeing that. Also, in terms of mapping, uh, we've got uh, sand and gravel channels here. Uh, two profiles that are 25. Uh, uh, 25 feet apart, and we can see changes in the uh, sand gravel distribution in these two channels. Obviously, up here we have uh, higher resistivity, and this might, this might seem a, a little contradictory to you as well. You know, this is still these are very um, very low conductivities. You know, when we're up here around 320. We're looking at uh, conductivities, if you do the math, they're about 3 millimoles per, per meter. And, um, and when we get down here to around 100, then this is 10 millimoles per meter. So these are freshwater sand and gravel aquifers. Uh, the clays are, well, they, have, they're, they're, they act like cations. They have... Uh, uh, anions that are free to move. They're, they're basically good conductors. So they have lower resistivity, even lower resistivity. So uh, two profiles, 25 meters apart, we can follow the changes in stratigraphy very, very nicely uh, between these two, two profiles. And, uh, and again, just kind of get used to thinking in terms of the comparison between resistivity and conductivity. You're, you're used to thinking in terms of Conductivity, we started off with the discussion of conductivity methods, strain conductivity methods, and, and so, so here we are looking at resistivity, the reciprocal of that. Other factors, uh, try to find a landfill. Uh, are there leaks in the landfill? Uh, <clears throat> mapping the extents of the landfill. Maybe this is an old landfill. You don't uh, know how deep it is. Uh, you don't know how extensive it is. Um, so resistivity method allows us to um, uh, kind of map out the distribution of resistivities associated with the landfill and uh, helps us determine the limits of this uh, landfill. Uh, other factors, uh, well, temperature, uh, leachate concentration, and so on lead to the uh, much lower resistivity associated with the interior of this uh, landfill, a as expected. A lot of dissolved ions. So a couple things to, uh, you know, just as we wrap up this, this video, just to think about. Uh, drawbacks and assets. Um, when you're doing the resistivity survey, you're usually thinking about, well, should I do resistivity or train conductivity? One of the drawbacks for resistivity is that you have to go out. It's more labor intensive. You have to go out there, put electrodes in the ground. Uh, you don't really know, you know, if you have a really low resistivity zone in the uh, uh, near surface, uh, you may not be able to get current uh, uh, into the subsurface. You may not be reaching the zone of interest. Uh, so the apparent conductivities that you measure may be associated with intervals that aren't of any interest to you. And again, labor intensive. Uh, the assets are that the resistivity method is uh, it's more versatile in the sense that um, there are fewer restrictions on electrode spacing. Remember with the train conductivity method, we were talking about uh, one set of instruments there, the EM31 and the EM34, so we basically had four intercoil spacings with resistivity. We can have multiple uh, uh, resistivity. We can have multiple electrode spacings. We can measure the potential difference over, over a much wider range of electrode separations than we can with uh, train conductivity. And uh, also, we can we can deploy as many electrodes as we want, and uh, and get a data set which covers in detail, uh, in, in much more detail than we can with uh, Turing conductivity. And of course, that increases our interest to really resolve the features of interest to us in the uh, subsurface. So it's a it's a it's a very useful method. It does take longer. Um, 
And uh, next time we're just going to kind of drop back. We're going to take a look at resistivity basics. Uh, sources, sinks, basic uh, electrode configurations. So talk to you next time.